2023 annual year conference starts in 10 minutes.
do another round again, but first, I have the point totals. We are 500 points apart. 500, all right? So in second place, we have 168,000 points. And in first place, 168,500 points. Can I get a drum roll? Can I get a drum roll? All right. In first place, we have the Royals! Oh, wow. Good job. Good to Second place, the Knights. Right? I like... All right, I'm back. I'm back. All right, so we're going to start with our first game here. I need two girls, one girl from each team, and we're going to be doing a little bit of beach golf, all right? Beach golf, but I need the whole crowd to participate in this game. Right now, you're gonna play? What team are you from? Knights, so you're from here? The Knights, all right, so we have the Knights, and then... Only one, only one, only one. So you're on the Royals? You're on the Royals? All right, so we got the Knights, and we got the Royals. Uh, we're gonna start off with the Knights. So um, go ahead and grab that golf club in the back right there, and uh, Brother Jack, can you grab the beach balls as well? So in each section, we, be, we gave you a kiddie pool. What you guys can do is you work as a team. You guys can move that kiddie pool around. What she's gonna be doing is she's gonna be hitting the golf balls in the air. You guys just gotta catch the golf, uh, excuse me, the beach balls, all right? And we're gonna keep track of it. Does that make sense? You got it? So you're just gonna be right here. You're gonna hit the golf ball out and they're gonna try to catch it. No, with the golf club right here, golf club right here. Here you go. Got it. So let's do a test round. Go ahead, hit one out, one of them out. Test round, you, you're, you're, you're trying to hit it into the kiddie pool. Go ahead. Oh, hey, watch out in the front, you're gonna get hit. You got it, just try to get some air on it, all right? Try to hit it high. All right. Oh, let's get a, uh, Brother Seth, let's give this one over to the Knights. The, the, this middle, middle section is the Royals. All right, that's 2,000 points to the Knights. They got some team spirit. Good job. Oh, 2,000 Royals. All right, let's give a countdown. Five, four, go first, go first. You're first, you're first. Grab the gun. All right, five, four, three, two, one, and go. You got a minute. You guys can throw it back up. You guys can throw the beach balls back up for more, more chances. All right, keep going, keep going. You got a minute. Here we go. Oh, we got two. She's got two. Keep in it. You can hit them all. You can hit them all. All right, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. She's got two so far. Let's hear you cheer. Come on, let's hear you cheer. We got three. Whack them all. You can whack them all. All the balls. All right, we got 10 seconds left. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, all right, all right, all right. So, so she got, that one didn't count. She had five, all right? That one, yeah. All right, let's get that over to the Royals. Let's get those over to the Royals. We're gonna have two guys after this, right? Two guys are gonna go right after this. You ready? 2,000 plus Royals, I love that spirit. Are you ready? All right, let's give her a countdown. Five. Just keep hitting them. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You can move your hands up a little bit more. There you go. All right. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Oh, swing up, swing up. There you go. We got 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, she got three. First place to the Knights. We're going to bring up the Wheel of Misfortune right now. I need two more guys, though. Two guys. We're going to do this again. We're going to do one more round of this. Two guys from each team, all right? Alrighty, 
Where's our, where's our, who got, who got second place? Young lady, young lady, you can't escape it, young lady. Hello, 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 hello. You gotta come back up here, it's not over for you. If losing wasn't bad enough, it's our favorite time of the night. Everyone say with me, we love Miss Fortune. All right, I don't know if you've noticed, we've made some adjustments to our wheel for tonight. Um, we took off any way to win anything, so you only lose. We added in another fish lap, another pie, just to make it extra special for our final night. So go ahead, everybody say it with me now. Spin! All right, oh, it's starting off well. We got a good old fashioned fish slap. Brother Mark, bring that on out. Why don't you guys step aside while we get ready for this? Step aside. Come on out right here. We got a fresh, um, what, three day old, right? That's pretty fresh. Uh, fish. They're getting it, it's still alive. Careful, careful. It's not alive, I'm kidding. It's been dead for a very long time. I don't know if that's worse. I don't know oh, if that's better. On. All right, here we go. Oh, man. All right, ready? Here we go. On the way, fish slap. Oh. All righty, I'm hoping to see way, way more fish slaps tonight. He took it easy on her. All right, Brother Mark. All right, we're going to do one more round. I think the guys, I think you guys can do some, I think we have some power hitters here. Power hitters. So got it, you guys are here? All right. What team are you on? The Royals. It's the Royals. And now who we got here? Me. From where? The Knights. The Knights, yeah. All right, let's start with the Knights. All right, let's start with the Knights over here. Let's give them the kitty pulls. Do you have the, the gloves? That get the club right here. Here you go, Nick. Are you a power hitter? You got this? All right, let's go ahead and get these balls up. Can you help me out, man? Let's get these balls up right here. All right, we got our, we got our. All right, we're gonna make a rule for the guys. You guys gotta stay in the, in the aisles, all right? Stay in the aisles. In the aisles, behind the first row at least. Let's, I wanna see some power here. All ready? All right, let's give them a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Oh, come on. Oh! All right, one. You got one. Come on, man. You got a swing of hit. Golf club. I see you cheer. 1,000 points. Nice. Some cheering over here. That's two. That's two. Come on, man. Hit it like you mean it. All right, we got three. We got three. Five, four, three, two, one. Stop. All right, he got five, he got five. All right, let's get those, let's get these over to the Royals. All right, Kyle, that's Kyle, right? You got this? All, right, all you gotta get is five. You think you can get five? Five? Now hold up, it can't, it's gotta be behind the first row, behind the first row. You got the club? Where'd you actually get the club here? Last round, here we go. 1,000 points to Royals. All right, five, four, three, two, one, go! Come on, you gotta catch it. There you go, you got one, he's got one. He's got one, two. All right, 10 seconds left, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, it's tied, three. Two, one! Oh! What a clutch shot at the buzzer. Mr. Kyle himself. So what does that mean? Oh, my favorite contestant, Nicholas Peck. Step right up. We know what time it is. It's that time again. We're going for buzz, right? We want a buzz cut. I, I think it fit his head nicely. But right now it's time for the will of... Alrighty, Nick. When everybody says it, go ahead and spin that wheel. Go ahead, Nick, give it a good spin. Okay. All right, he went with a soft approach. Let's see how that works out for him. Oh, yes, please. Please stop. 
Oh, we got another one coming. All right. We got the new hairstyle. New hairstyle coming on up. All right, come on out now. Bring it on out. I guess due to budget cuts, they took away the clipper, so he's just getting a brand new hairstyle, custom styled by yours truly. I mean, if anybody has clippers in their car, we'll do a buzz cut right now. Yeah, there we go. All righty, zoom in, let's get a close up. He's got a new hairstyle. He's got a brand new haircut. Here we go. Little more, little more. Come on, fix that hairline. That hairline needs a lot of work. Give him a nice blend, maybe thin it a little bit. Yeah. Oh my goodness. More on the hairline, come on. Let's get a little bit more, come on. Cut, 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 cut. All right, don't, don't help the man. This is supposed to be a punishment, come on. There we go, right. yeah! <laughs> Please don't make him bleed. I don't think we're covered for that. Oh. Oh. Good job, Nick, he's looking fresh. Brother right. Mark, let's start our next game. Let's give it up for Nick, right? You get, that was good, good for Nick. All right, this next game, before this next game, there's a Brianna from Clairview Baptist. Is, is clear water? All right, I, we owe you a gift card, so I got a gift card for you for Chick-fil-A, $10 gift card. Let's give Brianna a hand. There you go. I owe her a gift card, too. She's reminding me. All right, there you go. She gets a gift card, too. All right, I need two guys, right? One guy from each team. Wait, hold up. Before I get you, before I get you, they have to be a sharp shooter. All right, you got to be a good shot. You got to have some good aim. So... I know you played already. Have you played yet? All right, come on up, come on up. Oh, we're the Royals, one for the Royals. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I need a Royals, one guy for the Royals. Winner gets a gift card. Winner gets a gift card. Gary, 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 Gary. Get him set up, get him set up. While they get set up, let's get some cheers for a t-shirt. Who wants a t-shirt? Come on. I gotta hear you. I really gotta hear you. I still can't hear you. But that's because my eardrums broke. All right, what about the Knights? What about the Knights? Who wants a t-shirt? I can't hear you. I can't hear you, come on. Do I got any more? Alrighty, so the object of this game is they're gonna have some cat. These are catapults on their feet, and we have some whistling rockets. They're made of rubber. They're not gonna break anything. Sorry, Pastor. All right, so we have these targets around the auditorium. If you look up there, there's a target up there. Uh, some of you in the crowd have targets, right? You guys have targets. All right, so here's here's the deal. They're gonna be going at the same time. They have one minute to hit as many targets as they can with these rockets, all right? And also, what you can do to help your team out is throw the rebounds back up. You can run them up to him, you can throw them, whatever you wanna do, all right? Are we almost ready? So scoot up here, you guys can scoot up here a little bit. And let's go ahead and give him some rockets too. He can go right here, he can go right here. Yeah, spin him up, spin him up. Spin him up, spin him up. Six feet, yeah, there you go. And watch out, because these things come in hot, so if they miss, you do want to be prepared. Please pay attention, please pay attention. So Viewer discretion is advised, right watch out your own right risk, you have been warned. Like Just hook it, right? Just hook it onto that, got it? Hold it by the tip, it's easier if you hold it by the tip over here, okay? Gary, got it's it? over there, Gary, it's right. over there. Gary, it's over there to the right. You ready? Okay, let's give him a countdown. Five, Please four, be aware. Three, two, one, go! Oh, come on, you gotta aim a little higher, aim a little higher, aim a little higher. 
This is a really good opportunity if you're mad at your youth conference to aim right at them. Let's hear some cheers, come on. Oh, we got one, we got one. We got one. Oh, oh. almost hit for the Jerry on the top deck. 30 seconds, 30 seconds. I want to look, oh, not that way. 30 seconds. I think Gary's just serving a personal vendetta right, on everybody he's ever made him mad right now. 20 seconds, 20 seconds, come on! I'm almost positive Gary's not aiming for the targets. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, How many times he's going to hit the same spot? Four, come on! 3, 2, 1, stop! Oh, right at the cameraman. Right at the camera guy, that was a good shot. Unfortunately, that doesn't count. So Brother Gary is our loser. Oh. <laughs> so unfortunately for him, but very fortunate for us, that means he gets to join us on our favorite time of the night. You know what time it is. I know what a time it is. It's time for the wheel. Is fortune. All right, Gary, here we go. There's no getting out of it. Spin the wheel. Ready, here we go. Fish slap, fish slap. Oh, oh, wait. Please be the fish, please be the fish, please be the fish. Yes, fish slap. Bring it on out. Everyone say it with me. Fish slap. All right, we're not going easy. I want a good wind up. Please don't knock him out though. <laughs> Here we go, ready. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't kill the kid, don't kill the kid. Three, two, one. Oh, no, no, we're doing that again. Dunking's not allowed. All right, time to ratchet up. Three, two, one. Oh, I can smell that from here. Oh boy, we'll be cleaning that up for days. All right, at this time, we got the final episode of our skit. It's the last beacon of hope that these people have. We need your help. I'm sorry, kid, but if the Knights have already been captured, we've already lost. You can't just give up. We need somebody to stand. If you're not going to fight, then I will. <laughs> I know what you're going to say, but I can't. I'm not strong enough. <laughs> you listen to me, Master Thomas. You are the city's last hope. Now I get it. You don't think you're strong enough? You don't think there's any hope? But you're wrong. Everyone has it in themselves to be better, to be stronger. You, above anyone else, should know that a hero is not born. He is forged. Have you forgotten that? And if I know, if you're willing to sit back while your city falls into the hands of evil, then I failed you, Master Thomas. I failed you.
Okay, so from what I've observed, all excursions men, they seem to be infiltrating the service. The bomb has been planted inside the auditorium, but it hasn't been armed yet. I'm not sure what he's waiting for. An audience. The church is having their annual youth conference today. The church is the only planet on the way the church. No. He wants to kill everyone if he needs to. Here's the plan. I need you to back up the town from the living room. If Scourge's bomb goes off, we need to limit the amount of casualties. I'll head inside to stop the bomb. But won't you need help? Don't worry about me. I can handle these guys. Once you clear the surrounding area, you need to get as far away as possible. If the bomb goes off, this city will still need a knife. Okay, Dark Knight. You can count on me. We got the bogey on the perimeter. I need all units to the auditorium staff. Andres, time to go. Let's go make your mama proud. All right, we're going to get ready to sing a song here in just a moment. the Baptist Church. Tonight, you will witness this city's liberation. For far too long, the likes of Brother Ross and Brother Joseph have been governing Long Beach unruly, making promises of forging the next generation, one of which will be able to retake this city. But unfortunately, I don't see that generation here tonight. This bomb, right here, this bomb. This bomb, right here, is on. This bomb is very dangerous. And this bomb is set to go off in just a few minutes. But unfortunately, they will burn this church to the ground. Not if I have anything to town. say about it. Who is that? Dark Knight! Scourge! How nice of you to join us! Take care of it! Dark Knight! Oh. Uh. Hey, Is that all you got? Dark Knight! What do you see in these people? They are just sinners. I see a youth group tonight who will one day grow and be able to serve the Lord with their lives! Dark Knight, they are unworthy. Maybe, but a good friend of mine once told me that everyone has it in themselves to rise above who they have been. These youth groups may not be perfect, but everyone can be forged. I disagree.
Hello. All right, let's try this again. This time for real, let's stand together. We're gonna sing 495. 495, I survived. Took care of him in the back. 495 cents, Jesus came into my heart. Great job, guys. That was awesome. Glad Seth didn't break his leg on his way down. 495 cents, Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change. Let's sing it out nice and strong on that first verse. What a wonderful change in my life has been brought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roar that skit none of that was approved okay he did sign the waiver release thank you for being here how many of you had a great time at Knott's Berry Farm <clears throat> all right how many of you are tired because of it all right well let's if during the message it'll be okay they don't mind if you get tired just slap yourself if someone next to you gets tired slap yourself okay don't slap them that's not right we are looking forward to a great last night. Thank you for being here. I know it's been a long, a long few days, uh, three long nights and a couple days, but, but this is important, and thank you for being faithful, and God has something for us tonight, and I'm looking forward to it. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for what you've done so far, Lord, but we are really excited about what you have for us tonight. And I pray, Father, you would be with us. Help us to, to still our hearts when the messages are being preached. Help us, Lord, to, to listen with spiritual ears and open hearts to what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In sparkling stars upon the midnight summer sky, the majesty and wonder of the ocean's endless tide. And the more I see, the more I can't explain how the one who set the world in place could even know my name, and I'm amazed. I'm so amazed how great you are, how small I am, how awesome is your mighty hand, and I am captured by the wonder of it all. And I will offer all my praise with all my heart for all my days. How great you are. How great
and snowflakes gently fall, yet no two are the same. And colors fill the canvas of the seasons as they change. And everywhere I look, I see your hand. Why you would love someone like me, I'll never understand. And I'm amazed, I'm so amazed How great you are, how small I am How awesome is your mighty hand And I am captured by the wonder of it all And I will offer all my praise With all my heart for all my days how great you are, how great you are, how great you are, how small I am, how awesome is your mighty hand, and I am captured by the wonder of it all, and I will offer all my praise, with all my heart for all my days. Amen. Thank you for that song. Let's stand together, please. 555 in our psalm books. 555. Five, five. This is a good song. So much to thank him for. We'll sing both verses. 555. Let's lift it up together on that first verse. When I look around and see the good things that he's done for me, I know I'm unworthy of them all. service tomorrow we just have a couple announcements uh, for our church folks we're on regular schedule for Saturday our, our prayer meeting at 9 30 in the Spanish auditorium and then we'll follow that up with our faithfulness rally at 10 o'clock and then we do not have service tomorrow you're welcome to come but no one's going to be here so uh, you can have your own service we're, we won't have that the next Tuesday night we start back up with our our summer saturation I think we'll leave it at that for now I'm supposed to announce the winner of the Apple watch um, from Faith Baptist Church Brian he needs to learn how to write Poljoy anybody know him you, do you know him you don't want to know him though right no, you want to take the watch to him or you just want me to say that you win is he here? Well, you guys could just have the watch then, okay? So, I, redraw? Forget it. No, all right. 
<laughs> he, he's probably watching, so sorry, Brian. Uh, we gave your watch. Did he just buy one? Someone told me he just bought one. He literally, isn't that how it works? The people that have one, and I'll let Brother Ross figure that one. All right, let's sing together Why we, we're going to sell the watch after the service, okay? Why don't we do that? Let's all stand together. 215 in our songbooks. Last song that we'll sing together. 215, the greatest of all miracles. 215 on the first. Let's sing it together. I wasn't there by the shores of Galilee. When Jesus touched those blinded. exactly what you want to speak to us about. Lord, please bless this offering. Thank you for the bus ministry. Lord, might this offering help it to further the work you want to do there. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated.
Music has been good the last few days. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been mostly our singles and our young people, I think, except for maybe one. All of them have basically been born here and raised here. Brother Gray talked about the next generation, and, and that's, that's our heartbeat. And by the way, that's the heartbeat of your workers that brought you here from your church. They've invested a lot of time and effort to get you here, and not because they don't have something else to do, because they believe in you. And they believe in what God can do in your life. And so that's why we're here, and that's why we're into the preaching. And Brother Hicks is going to come. I appreciate Brother Hicks. I, I, 
usually every summer at the beginning of the summer I'll start there's youth conferences going on and I'll listen to youth conference messages whether I'm walking or exercise whatever and um, I heard brother Hicks uh, a couple years ago I'm like he's got to come we got to have him here and uh, he's just been a tremendous blessing been with us since Sunday and uh, we've used him a lot and so he's got one more good one left for you guys and so let's give him a warm welcome as he comes to preach for us tonight Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 15, and I do, I, I want to say thank you. This, this church has blessed my heart this week since Sunday morning, and I sure do appreciate being with you. I sure do appreciate Brother Myers inviting me. Brother Nathan has been there every moment of the way and checking on us and making sure ever, everything that we needed was provided, and I can't thank you enough. Allow my three sons to come and be a part of this ministry just momentarily here during this week. I can't thank you enough. Appreciate what you've done. Every servant, every individual, every skit, every individual that I saw out there in the parking lot working and putting forth to making this place presentable for this conference and the glory of God. I just want to say thank you. I'm going to jump right in this message tonight. It's heavy on my heart. Pray for me. I know I'm going to talk fast because I've got a long ways to go. So you're going to have to listen fast. We'll talk about Abraham a little bit tonight. What was Abraham? Abraham was Mr. Faithful. You not need to turn there. I'm going to catch up with you in Genesis in a minute. But in Hebrews 11, 8, the Bible said, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. You know, a lot of times the will of God won't be shown to you until you surrender wholeheartedly for the will of God. Hebrews eleven seventeen 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Number two, Abraham was a friend of God. In James chapter 2 and verse 23, and the scriptures was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness for he was called the friend of God. Now, you're not in control of a lot of things in life, but there's two things that you are completely in control with. You, young person tonight, or, or anybody therefore is under the sound of my voice, you're in control of yourself being faithful, being completely faithful, and you're also in control of being friend to God. Now, I catch up with you there in Genesis chapter 15. I'm gonna read all the way down through verses 11. And the Bible said, and after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, fear not, Abram, I... I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what will, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the steward of my house and the Ele Eliezer of Damascus? And I and Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bow shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and accounted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of your earth, out of the Chaldees, and to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, now listen to me. He said, take me a heth heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he said unto him, all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And here's my text verse tonight. And when the fowls came down, Upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the music. God, music puts us in the presence of almighty God. Thank you so much for that. Lord, we're here 
And Lord, we're begging you from on high, God, to do something great for us. God, I pray that these young people, again, would not see Rob Higgs, but would see the word of God. Lord, I pray that the spirit of God would touch their heart like never before in their life. Do something absolutely miraculously through the hearts of the people under the sound of my voice. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for your word. It's perfect. It's preserved. It's infallible. Amen. And I want to see you do something with it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We will learn in these scriptures that we can find the will of God for our life. Look, women, keep your Bible open for a little while. The Bible says there in verse seven, God brought him out in order to bring him in. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of, or out of the child is to give thee this land to inherit it. Abraham asked God, how shall I know the will of God? In Genesis 15, eight, Genesis, he said, Lord God, where? By shall I know that I shall inherit it. Then he shows Abraham that the will of God requires sacrifice. In verse 9, he said unto him, take me a heifer of three years old and she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece against another, but the birds he divided not. I'm gonna tell you something tonight. The will of God requires sacrifice. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. He said a living sacrifice. What's that mean? It means you act dead to life when God chooses to give you the will for your life and 100% total surrender. You can't find anywhere in this book from Genesis to Revelation that the a will of God has ever failed. The fire has never failed upon an empty altar and it never will. It requires sacrifice. What did Abraham sacrifice? Number one, he sacrificed the best. Verse 9, he said unto them, take me a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old. Let me tell you something, friend. That three-year-old beast was when that animal was worth the most that it was going to be worth. Uh, hey, I'm gonna tell you tonight, young people, God don't want your scraps. Uh, God don't want your leftovers. God don't want your stuff that you're taking down to the thrift store. God wants the absolute best that you have, young people, and you won't ever go wrong giving to him. What is the best? You're the best. You're the best. You're the absolutely best that you can give to God. Uh, have you ever told God that, God, you can have me and everything that I have to give? I told you a little bit I don't know which all these messages run together if you ask me but I told you I was an Alabama boy man I was as happy as I could be I was satisfied I would tell anybody and everybody I'll never leave East Central Alabama that was my home I would have lived there I would have died there I built a business there I was very successful there man I was living a dream but God stepped in God stepped in and said son I want you and I want you to surrender everything that you've got to surrender and he called me to a place that was unknown just like he called Abraham to a place that he knew not. He called me up north, Yankee land, amen. He said, I want you to surrender and go up there and get trained. And I went out there not knowing where I went. And son, I found out I was entering into the armpit of the entire world. Somebody say amen right there. Geographically, there was nothing to smile about whatsoever. I didn't want to be in that place at all, but I wanted to be in the will of God. And I'm going to tell you something that was the greatest decision decision at that time for my life that I'd ever made. I'd released everything to go there. Number two, he sacrificed the little things. Huh? The little things. Who cares about little things? Look at the latter part of that verse. Turtle doves and young pigeon. Okay. The little old birds that carries around a bunch of mites and 
dirty little bugs and stuff. What's the big deal about it? Yeah, well, them little things, what can get you caught up? After I got saved serving God, I was on fire for God. Seems like everything that come out of my mouth was about God. Everybody at church knew me and knew that I, I couldn't wait to get the gospel to this friend and that friend and that friend and that friend and all the drug buddies that I had. I, I was bringing them to church and getting them saved. Uh, man, seeing their lives transformed. Uh, and it was just every single weekend and week out and week in and week out. Uh, oh, but let me tell you something. Later on down the road, uh, old brother Rob uh, got back into them horses. Yes, sir. I, I mean, I had me a horse ranch right there in Alabama. Man, and I was raising them. I was breaking them. I was training them. And I had some fine, fine horses. Ain't nothing wrong with no horses, amen. Don't you look at me like that. Uh, nothing wrong with horses. Uh, and boy, I'm going to tell you something. I had a stud horse. His name was Twisting Time. He was out of a $100,000 show horse. Uh, man, I trained him from a little old coat. Uh, I could take that horse and make that horse lay down. I could lay on top of that horse. Hit that horse was just like a dog. Man, I could get a horse out there in the middle of that pasture. I could take that horse with nothing but a bridle and a rope and jump on his back and son, I'd take off wide open across that pasture and I could just sit down on his back like this and that horse would sit down and literally slide for 40 feet, man. And I would step off his backside looking for ever more coo. I loved horses. I loved to ride them, train them, and break them. I had a good buddy at church. Man, oh man, he loved horses. But see, there was something going on that shouldn't be going on. You see, he keyed into something. That conversation that used to come out of Rob Hicks's mouth about this guy over here I got a burden for and that person over there I got a burden for, he saw it shift when nobody else recognized it shifting. He saw it shift from going from that soul over there to that saddle over there. He saw it shift from going over there, oh, this person is having trouble over here, let's help him, to let's go look at this mare down the road. I might be able to make some money on it. He saw it shifting from, oh, my soul, what a preaching service to, oh, Oh man, let's go a uh, horse riding this weekend. Uh, and he saw that. And I said, Darren, let's go riding. He said, okay, I'll go riding with you. Best friend. We rode all day and I could sense something. All day long I could sense something through my best friend. And I'll never forget when we got done and hung those saddles up. We got in the pickup truck. And Darren looked over at me with as serious face as he could look. And he said, Rob, what is wrong with you? Man, I'm going to tell you something. That might have been fighting words for anybody else. And son, I would have fought you with a drop of a hat. And I'd drop the hat just to fight with you. But I'm going to tell you something. The Spirit of God had already prepared me for that statement. And it hit me right in the heart. He didn't have to say anything else. It was revealed by the writing on the wall. And I just wadded up like a little old baby in a fetus position and began to weep. And my whole life flashed before me. Why? Little things, little things. You see, nobody could come up to Rob Hicks and say, you're fooling with them horses. Them horses is sinful, boy. Hey, you need to leave them horses. Nobody could say that to me. Nobody at all. But let me tell you something. God had touched a man's heart. He had touched a man's heart. And that man opened it. Hey, be careful when somebody comes to you out of love. And wants to help you. Don't retaliate. I'm going to tell you, you need to act and not react. And I surrendered right then. I said, God, I'm so sorry. I believe he's sour my ministry and my Christian life. What's your point, Brother Rob? What is a little thing? Nobody can jump in your face about it. What is it? What, what is drawing you away from the word of God? What's drawing you away from serving God? What's drawing you away from giving everything that you have to God? Huh? Is it hunting? Is it fishing? Is it vacation? Is it TV? Is it friend? Is it internet? Is it some kind of hobby? Is it golf? I don't know what it is. Do you know what it is? None of them things are sinful. But when they get in between you and the Savior, they'll wreck your life. 
Everything in our life can be balanced. I could have kept those horses if it had been balanced, but I said, no, no. God, you send somebody to buy them, and they're gone. That was the easiest sale that I'd ever done in my life. One after another, horse trailer drove down my driveway with horse tails sticking out the back over and over and over. I believe one of the greatest decisions I've ever made in my life. Number three, he sacrificed the biggest things. Look with me in verse 10. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. Huh? These big old heavy pieces had to be cut up, didn't they? Huh? Let me tell you something. The will of God. It's going to require more than one trip to the altar. Just because you get broken yesterday and broken Sunday, just because you got broken sometimes this week and you came and you fell on your face, let me tell you something. There's some bigger things in your life that's going to show up and you're going to have to make trip after. Why? Because you're not strong enough to carry all of those burdens at one time, young people. I told you a little bit about this morning, I think, when I, I went to college, that one, that first year, my wife diagnosed with malignant melanoma cancer in the four stages. There's only five stages and, and son your life is gone. My, my little firstborn boy was diagnosed with autism not even knowing if he was going to be able to walk, not even knowing what kind of situation that we were going to live with. The same year I fell on a construction site and messed up disc in my back and my life was turned upside down. Let me tell you something young people I could not carry that load of sacrifices I couldn't do it. I had to keep going back to the altar and 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 back to the altar. You can never get away from making trips to the altar to meet with God. And he'll show you so much through what you feel like might be burdens in your life. He showed me how much I loved my wife when I become helpless. I remember sitting before a preacher poured my heart out to him. At home, I've always been known as Mr. Fix-It. I can fix anything. If that joker is broke, I'm going to tell you something, I can fix it. I will guarantee you I can put it together. And I've been known that way. In my house, I'm known as Mr. Fix-It. And I sat across from that man and poured my heart out during this time of these burdens. And he said, Brother Rob, I hate to tell you this, he said, but your problem is you're prideful, sir. And I begin to bristle and I begin to bow up and I'm like, I'm pouring my heart out to you and you're saying my problem is pride. I don't see it. He said, Brother Rob, you've always been able to fix everything. God has put you in a situation that you have to 100% trust him with what's going on in your life. There's gonna be times that you can't do anything. You are totally helpless young people. Nothing that you can do. No move that you can make. No amount of money that you can spend. No amount of effort and strength that you can give to fix the problem. It's not going to happen. But your strength can be manifested. The love that I had for my wife multiplied 10,000 times. As my son grew through life, remember me preaching to you about one day at a time? I had no idea. It wasn't the fear of having a special need child. It was the fear of taking care of a special need child. I wanted to be properly loved and properly taken care of, but I had no idea that God had chose a set of parents that would love him more than any other parents in the entire universe. And he used that young man to make my life become closer and closer to Christ. He's 27 years old. He's much bigger than I am. He's an adult man. 
I have to take care of him. We split the responsibility. I want him to be my boy. I don't push him off on mama. And she takes care of him all day. I come in. I come in and you know what? I bathe two adult men. I bathe myself and I bathe my son. I'll never forget one time when I was praying to God and I said, Lord, how in the world can I, I be closer to you? How can I be a better servant to you? How can I be like you? And I'm gonna tell you a great conviction come over to me. He said, son, you can't can't be like me. I'm me. The only way in the world that you can even remotely come close to being like me is when you're in the shower giving that young boy, that 27-year-old man that I placed in your life, giving him a shower, reaching down and washing his feet. And I said, God, there's no ulterior motive in washing his feet. I get it. There's so many ulterior motives about humanity today. You've got some other reason that you're doing this and you're doing that. It's not about God. Let me tell you something. I get no reward out of washing his feet except the reward of being his father and loving him with all the love that I have. Christianity is about love and not alternative motives. And I'm gonna tell you, every single one of us is guilty of it, including the preacher that's yelling and screaming at you right now. But what an unbelievable lesson the Spirit of God taught me. You got a load of burdens? Cut them up. They too heavy to tote, cut them up. Take them to the altar over and over and over again. The will of God requires faithfulness. Faithfulness. It's one thing for us to sacrifice. It's another thing to keep that sacrifice. Here's the text verse. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. What were these fowls? They were buzzards. These buzzards represent the evil beast. Who are these buzzards? Number one, they're your so-called friends. You're going to see them when you get back home. You're going to hear them when you get back home. What did y'all do? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. We had an incredible time. We had wonderful skits and we had laughter and we had food and we went out to a park and there was preaching there and I made some unbelievable decisions for the glory of Almighty God. What kind of decisions? And you share those decisions with them and you be proud to share those decisions with them. Let me tell you something. They're going to get in your face and they're going to tell you you're crazy, you're a knucklehead, you got no sense, you're just a brainwashed idiot. Let me tell you something, you better run them buzzers away from your sacrifices because them buzzers, them so-called friends are gonna come right down here to the altar where you put those sacrifices on and they're gonna steal every sacrifice that you give to God and they're gonna haul them off. Number two, they're your unsaved or backslidden family members. And let me say this before I go on. There's never, ever, ever a time for you to be unkind to a backslidden or lost family member. You, my friend, are the only Bible that they're going to read. But don't you ever be intimidated and interfered with or interrupted by whatever sacrifice that you put on the word of God. You stand strong and you love those unsaved or backslidden family members. And you just say, so and so, God touched my heart about this. Maybe you don't understand And I don't expect you to understand. 
It's not your sacrifice. It's my sacrifice. Don't you call him a buzzard. Don't you be unkind. Don't you be a smart aleck and just say that you're not spiritual. You love them and you let them watch you and you let you watch you tomorrow and next week and next month and they see your faithfulness. I can't tell you how many times that I hear the testimony and I was watching, I was watching them that week but that next month, and the month after and the year after and I come to terms at whatever that they done and whoever that they were serving was real. Number three. There are the old wicked flesh, yourself and myself. Mark. Chapter 14 and verse 38, the Bible says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. You see, the flesh is the only part of you and I that is not saved and never shall be. Did you hear what I said? I said the flesh is the only part of you and I that is not saved and never shall be. What does that tell us, Brother Rob? That tells us that this old flesh right here, saved or not saved, is always going to want to go back and do something that is not pleasing to God himself. We're in kept inside of this. Our saved spirit, our saved soul is inside of this shell. Thank God that we're going to drop this old shell one of these days and sin will never tempt us again for an eternity. But until that day, when you get up out of that bed it's coming to you it's going to tempt you you've heard just a little bit about my testimony and all the stuff that I was involved in all the drunkenness all the drugs and all the nonsense with the law and all that junk it caused me so many problems and the things that these eyes have seen that I cannot get away from I cannot erase them if I took off this suit right here or you would see the spiritual scars that is all over my body from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet that you never going to deal with any day of your life. You say, but Brother Rob, how in the world, how in the world do you tame that? How do you control that? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31, he said, I die daily. Does that mean Paul committed suicide every day? No. That means that he committed spiritual suicide every day. That means in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, give yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It's not good enough for you to make a decision. Walk down here because of conviction and surrender something. You must surrender yourself. You surrender yourself first. Then you surrender whatever it is that God is telling you to surrender. And you place it on an old-fashioned altar just like this right here. You see, when you take care of that surrender, and that body is a living sacrifice, but it's acting like a dead sacrifice, and when you get up every morning, you repeat that. Repeat what? Exactly what Paul had to repeat. He told us right there how he made it in life. You and I can't make it any differently. We must do the same thing. What's the procedure, Brother Rob? Get up every morning. I have to get up every morning and climb out of my bed every single day and die to self. I have to commit spiritual suicide. Oh, I'm gonna tell you something, friend. I get up and say, God, these eyes right here are not ready for what's on the other side of that door. As soon as I pull out to that highway, guess what? There's billboards out there, God. Hey, I'm not ready for it. And if these eyes are not sacrificed to you, there's no telling what they're gonna wanna look at. And God, I kill them this morning. God, I sacrifice this morning, Lord. I'm gonna tell you something, God. This old uh, mouth, 
I have to sacrifice this mouth because if I don't, there's no telling what it might say. God, I have to sacrifice these hands right here because I don't know what they might want to touch today. God, these feet that carry me everywhere that I go, I've got to sacrifice them today. I've got to sacrifice every single thing that I have in this body and kill it. Then, then I can pick up this sword. And when I pick up this sword, I mean business with it. And I'm talking about I mean business with it. If Rob Hicks does that and gets everything taken care of spiritually, and I hold this sword right here, but every single sacrifice that I've brought to the altar to my Savior, as soon as them buzzards come inside of me, I take this sword right here and I slice them all to pieces and they drop one after another and they've been dropping one after another for almost 29 years of my life. You see, I live the way I live for the next generation like your pastor is talking about. I'm responsible for those three boys right there, okay? That my testimony is responsible for those three boys. I, I, I tell you right now, your testimony is responsible for your friends right now. Not your children because you don't have, but you're responsible for the friends that watch you every single day of your life. What are you going to do? This is the last night. What kind of decisions are you going to make? You've done made multiple decisions this week, but I'm going to tell you something, friends. The worst thing that happens is when you walk out that door and head back to your home church or walk out to this door and go to this home right here that you live in this town and you allow the buzzers to Strip your altar clean because you're not willing to sacrifice you. You just get up, caught up in an emotional situation and say, I need to do this. But it's worthless if you allow them to strip your altar. What are you going to do when the buzzards come? How are you going to react when the buzzards come. My boys have heard me told many times about when we got saved, me and my wife, and we walked into our little old single wide trailer that we lived in in Rock Mills, Alabama. And I said, baby, I don't know anything about this Christian stuff. But I know on the other side of that door, there's a whole lot of things that's not pleasing to God. And I don't want to be around them no more. And she said, I don't either. And we went in that house and got all that nonsense and put it together. At the time, there's more nonsense that comes later as the word of God reveals it to you. But at the time, we took it and took it out in the woods and I found an old oak tree with a stump hole in it and stuffed it in there and walked away. Here we are, 20, almost nine years later. It was last year, I guess, maybe 28 years. My boys and I were visiting back down. I was preaching in Georgia. They said, Dad, you, you think you could find that oak tree? I said, I don't know, son. Let's go see. We went back to the home place where we lived and where we got saved and walked out in the woods and walking all around looking for a stump hole way down low. But here we are 28 years later and the stump hole had grew with the tree. My boy said, hey, here's one. Is it, maybe this it? And we shined that flashlight down in that hole and there it all still was there. And I said, praise God. Praise God that the buzzards hadn't pulled that sacrifice off the altar. It's still there. It's still gone. Huh? Let me tell you something. I'm going to make it easy tonight. I'm going to make it real easy tonight. Some of you got some stuff that you need to put on the altar. Some of you got some stuff that maybe last year, at last year's youth conference you put on the altar, but sadly to say the buzzers has already stripped your altar off. It's already gone. It's already disappeared. 
What was Abraham? When he drove the beast away, what was it? His Mr. Faithful. What do you have 100% control of? Being faithful. What was Abraham because he did this? What was it? A friend to God. You're in 100% control of being a friend to God. I've realized and I know after all these years, I'll never be some kind of polished individual. I'll always stutter. I'll always mispronounce word. I'll always make grammatical errors. But I can always be faithful. And I can always be a friend of God. What about you tonight? What about you tonight? Make a decision. Sacrifice whatever God wants you to sacrifice. Ma'am, could you go ahead and come to the instrument, please? I'm fixing to be done. Sacrifice whatever God wants you to sacrifice. That die to self. Huh? A living sacrifice to our Savior. Protect those sacrifices that are on the altar. And if you've been robbed tonight, retrieve those sacrifices and bring them back down to an altar because now you know how to protect them. Because Abraham was faithful and Abraham was a friend of God, he received the blessing. Now listen to me in verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying unto thy seed, I have given this land from the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. He came through because God protected those sacrifices on the altar. He never allowed the buzzards to take them. Do you want those blessings of God? Do you want those promises of God? I want to claim every single promise that God has the promise to give me. I don't want to lose one of them, not one of them. I don't want to lose any of my children. I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose my memory. I don't want to lose anything, not my integrity, not the preaching that he's given me. I don't want to lose nothing. So I'm going to fight to the day that I die protecting those sacrifices from the buzzards of this world. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Don't even hesitate a thought about it. Make a decision and make it right now. If you're serious, 100% serious, I've never tried to draw anybody to an altar call. I've never done that. The Holy Spirit can't do it. I dead sure don't want any part of it. But would you listen to the Spirit of God? As her fingers hits those keys, get serious and make a decision right now. Would you come? Please don't let the walk from the balcony hinder you. Don't, don't, that's right, that's right. Get up, don't, that's right, that's right. Don't let it hinder you. Don't let it stop you. Get up out of your seat if the Spirit of God has spoken to you tonight. Come down to the old fashioned altar. That's right, God bless you, son. God bless you. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, son. That's right. Don't you let those buzzards keep you in the balcony. That's right. That's right. One, two, three, four. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, the worst thing that we can do is allow those buzzards to snuff out the sacrifices we have given to Almighty God.
Father, we thank you for, again, another tremendous message we've heard. And Lord, help us to be willing to fight when we go away from this place, to keep the decisions and the commitments that we've made. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. I know you had a long day and you were at Knott's Berry Farm, and I think this is probably the warmest day we've had all year, and that's not that bad, but still. What, Brother Ross, why don't you come and we'll sing before we have our next special. If you have your hymn, there, you can grab that, number 28. Great is thy faithfulness, number 28. Great is thy faithfulness, number 28. Let's sing it together. Great is thy faithfulness.
want to know you more When my daily deeds ordinarily lose life and song My heart begins to bleed sensitivity to Him is gone I've run the race but set my own pace and face a shattered soul now the gentle arms of Jesus warms my hunger to behold to know you to feel your heart and know your mind looking in your eyes stirs up within me Christ that say I want to know you oh I want to know you and I will give my final breath to know you in your death and resurrection oh I want to know you more oh I want to know you to know you more Lord I want to know you Brother Gray, why don't you come? Thankful for him. This is our last message, and so uh, let's take advantage of the time we have. Very, very grateful for Brother Gray. You've come here probably too many times, so, but uh, ph phenomenal. We're so glad he's been a great friend to us, and so let's give him one last warm Pacific Baptist welcome. Good Myers, thank you. Amen, amen. Am I on? I'm on. I think I'm on. Amen. I've enjoyed being here. And uh, church family, thank you very much for uh, your love and uh, your giving. A church just doesn't put on a youth conference like this if it wasn't for members who are faithful to give and work. And uh, it's just been a blessing. And uh, let's get right into it. Can we do that? Would that be okay? Get your Bibles if you would. And we're going to the Old Testament. We're going to 1 Kings, if we could. We're going to kind of start out in chapter 17, and we're going to work our way through chapter 17 and chapter 18. And uh, just, uh, again, thank you for all the hospitality. Uh, it's always wonderful uh, to be here. Sister, thank you very much for the special. Always a blessing to hear you sing. Uh, so uh, 1 Corinthians, it is a home away from home. Uh, there's uh, many of you that uh, we know and to watch everybody grow up. That, that's, that's what's making you feel old at times. Uh, so it cost Brother Myers his hair. Uh, so that's what it cost him. Amen. Uh, but if you ever see a bald gentleman with a beard, that's just the proof of gravity. Amen on that one. Uh, so, uh, but anyways, first, first Kings, and we're going to go ahead and pray. Uh, and we are going to just kind of progress through uh, these chapters. Young people, I will tell you that you live in a great time. You just do. You, you live in a wonderful time with a great opportunity before you. And, and never forget what I'm about to say. Time will by default put you in leadership. Did you hear what I just said? Time by default, will put you in leadership. You are in the shadows, but it won't be too much longer that you will be on the front line. And I think that many times youth conferences like this, there's a reason why we don't hold old people conferences. Okay? One, they'd have to start about noon because they ain't getting up till 11. Amen? 
next, they would have to go till two because they would need their afternoon nap and then you'd have to get out. I promise you, all the old people that are doing this today and all the chaperones, they're going to die tonight and then they'll be resurrected, right? And no matter how young you think you are in your mind, your body does not know that. And I promise you, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have entered into such a sacred time. That is any time we can open your book. Lord, any time we can hear it preached, any time that we can hear songs and Lord, like we just heard, and we want to know you more. Or deep within ourselves, we want to know you. Lord, how in the world you put up with us is amazing. I think that, I told you often, Lord, that the greatest attribute I think about you is your long-suffering. That, that, that ability that you look at us from day to day and your mercies are new every day. And Lord, thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for being long-suffering. Would you give us one more truth that we can add to all the truths that we've heard this week and all the truths we're going to hear over the next year? And Lord, just watch over and bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to come to you tonight on behalf of your pastor. I want to come to you tonight on behalf of the men who stand and faithfully proclaim the word of God. They are a unique set of people. Every day, they wake up and they go to work in the word. Every day, they get up and they say, God, would you please give me what we need for the next time that we come to church? It's not like preaching a revival, and it's not like preaching a meeting that you can preach the same sermon over and over again, which all of us do. But it's something unique that you have to go to prayer during the week and you have to be ready to go at the 9.30 hour. You have to be ready to go at the 10.30 hour. You have to be ready to go at the 5.30 hour. You have to be ready to go at the Wednesday night. And it's it's a constant, it's, it's just a constant labor in the word. And you are very blessed to have a pastor. If you go look at 1 Kings chapter 17, just let your eyes kind of fall here because you're going to find out that Elijah in chapter 17 and verse number 1, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. You're going to find out that Elijah started out with a very much saying, let me tell you what's about to happen. He was a prophet. And by the way, you're not a prophet unless your prophecies come to pass. And it did. And all of a sudden, Elijah says, there's going to be no rain. Look at verse number eight. The widow then feeds Elijah. The word of the Lord came unto him saying, Get thee into Zarephath and belong it to Zidon and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So now we find out that Elijah steps up and Elijah's got to go to battle. He's got to do what God has told him to do. There's not going to be any rain. Then he find out that God takes care of the man of God. And God makes sure that he's taken care of and he uses a widow woman. And then we find out that Elijah, in verse number 17, he brings back to life a boy. I find find this very interesting in verse number 19. And he said unto her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the loft. And when he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Look at this counseling session. How would you like to have this one? And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord. And look at it. And in verse number 23, and Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. He was slain and now he's alive. This has been Elijah. Elijah is doing for the Lord. Elijah is speaking for the Lord. Elijah sees the fact that God has come through for him and miracles are happening. And then we know that in chapter 18, verse 17, we find that he's doing battle. This is the life of a preacher. He now is doing battle. 
And 450 prophets of Baal keep going, if you will, to chapter 19. And you're going to find that Elijah now uh, is, is, is uh, Elijah. There's abundance of rain coming at the end of chapter 18. When you get to chapter 19, you're going to find that Elijah now faces Jezebel. And in facing Jezebel, a discouragement sets in. Young people... Here we go. Are you ready for the sermon? Discouragement sets in. And when discouragement sets in, look at verse number nine. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said, what doest thou here? Your pastor is human. And your pastor can face a lot of things. He can do a lot of things. But there are times to where he feels like he is all alone. Now listen to this. It's not true. It's not true. About the time that your pastor's world comes all the way down. Pacific, please listen to what I'm about to tell you. Visiting churches, please listen. A pastor is working diligently to say what he needs to say. Go where he needs to go. Do what he needs to do. He's on the top of Mount Carmel, taking on the 450 prophets of Baal. But then all of a sudden, when God brings him through a cycle to where he said there'll be no rain, and now there is an abundance of rain, there, there comes this, I'm all alone. I've been jealous for the Lord. Look at 1 Kings 19.10, the Lord of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I... Even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. That was not true. So God comes to Elijah, and he says this in verse number 11. God begins to move. And he said, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Y'all listen, many a times that your pastor has thought to himself, good night, I preach, I teach, I, I do the best I can. And he gets discouraged. But in the cave of discouragement, there is the moving of the Lord. You leave a pastor alone long enough in the cave of discouragement, and there is something wonderful that happens. Now, you would think that when God begins to move in the heart of your pastor, that he moves in a mighty way. That's not how it happens. Let me give you insight into this profession of pastoring. That's not how it happens. When a man that pastors and is in a cave of discouragement, he does not see the wind. Look at verse number 11. And he said, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong and wind rent from the mountains and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Keep looking. And after the wind, a what? Earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. When the Lord starts doing things, a pastor has to remember that the Lord many times, not, not, young people, I'm going to lay a truth right at your feet, that many times that the earthquake and the wind, and then if you'll notice the fire, but he wasn't in the fire. What was he in? The still, look at verse 12. What was he in? The still, small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it. Now, 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 now I want you to, to understand what is about to happen because there's a word getting ready to be used that will be used again for the next generation. It is something that is transferable. And here's what it is, that he wrapped his face in his what? Mantle. A mantle was nothing more than a robe. We saw the skits and we saw how they wore this, these things. Do you, do you know that, that the men of God, the prophets... Do you, do you know what they wore? They wore a mantle. 
you, you could tell a man of God as he come walking through the crowd. Let me tell you how. In the Old Testament, he had a mantle. And when he was in that cave of discouragement, and when he was in that cave that he thought nobody else gets it, nobody else sees it. Pastor Myers, can I tell you something? There's a brotherhood of pastors that we preach and we teach and we pray and we work day in and day out. It's those obscure sermons while everybody else is on vacation. It's those, it's those Sunday school truths that you teach. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we think, does anybody else feel the pressure? And when God spoke in that still small, small voice, guess what he did with his man? It was right there. That he did what, please? He wrapped his face. And it's in this private time. This is where spiritual leaders, that's where they get their second win. Do you know what keeps your pastor going? Let me tell you what keeps your pastor going, teenager. What keeps your pastor going is not the bigness. He's got to hear that still, small voice. He's got to hear it from the inside out. That's why your church, if you have a pastor, listen, you're a very blessed church. If, if you have a pastor who is willing to say the tough things, willing to do battle against the falsities, then you're a very blessed church. And this Elijah at the end of chapter 19, he is like, good night. Is anybody else out there? And the answer to that question is this. Yes, there are other people out there. But I want you to notice that this mantle is getting ready to be used a second time. This time, he uses it to wrap it. But this is getting ready to be transferred. This is getting ready to be placed and cast. And young people, the only thing that a pastor wants to do is to transfer the responsibility to live for God. Church work is not something you pick up and you put down. You've got to see it. You've got to feel it. You've got to understand it that the pastor, the leader won't always be around. Can I ask you a simple question? If the pastor and the deacons didn't show up, and teenagers, if you were just left all on your own, would church still continue? Or would you go to the basketball court while you're supposed to be holding church? Would it be something that it would just be like, well, you know, pastor didn't show up. You know, the deacons didn't show up. Teenagers, what would it be if all of a sudden you showed up to church and it was just you? I want you to notice that he starts anointing. He gets a second wind out of the cave. And if you'll look at verse, verse number 14, and he said, I've been very jealous. Verse number 19, chapter 19, verse 14. I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Look at verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, go Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And I want you to notice this. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel. Are you there? To be king over at Syria. He says, anoint Haziel. Look at it. Don't trust me. Look at the word. Look at verse number 16. And Jehu, the son of Nim Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. He anointed three people. He anointed Hazel. He anointed Jehu. And then he anointed Elisha. Why? Because look at verse number 17. First Kings 19, 17. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu 
shall what, please? Elisha slay. Elisha was the third line of defense if the enemy got away. If the enemy got away, the first person would slay him. If the enemy got away from that, the second sword would get him. But if the enemy got away from those two, the third line of defense was Elisha. Young people, when you can go three deep in a church, when you got a pastor that will preach the word and do his best to spiritually lead, and then when you've got the deacons behind him, brother, you've got it going on. But what if they don't show up? Will you let the enemy get in? Would you let the world, the flesh, and the devil invade? When is the mantle going to be passed? Look at verse number 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle where? Young people, can I use you? Would that be okay? Come on up here, Cortez. Can, can I tell you? Here's Elisha. Just, just put your hands out like you're plowing. He's plowing 12 yoke of oxen. He's on his 12th yoke according to the Bible. 12 oxen. Let me tell you something. And the man of God is just, is just passing by. And the scripture says that while he's passing by, he just throws the mantle and he keeps on going. Do you know what your pastor's trying to do every time he gets up to preach? He's just trying to take the pressure he feels about winning the world to Christ. And guess what he just wants to do? He just wants to cast it on you and he's going to go on. This is what the Lord wants in your life. And we have been preaching and we have been teaching and you have heard some great messages by Brother Hicks and you have heard some great messages from your pastor. And do you know the only thing that we're trying to do is this, is to let you know that you do have a responsibility to carry on the works that you have seen done. And tonight, do you see it? Because as we pass by, here's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to throw on you how we feel when we're alone with the Lord. That's why we preach about standards and that's why we preach about soul winning and that's why we preach about the world and that's why we preach and say, look, look, there are people dying going to hell. Just don't be a soul winner at a, at a set time. Get you some tracks and be a soul winner all the time. But teenagers, do you just come in and check out because there's food? Do you just come in and check out because there's ball? Do you just come in and check out? Is your backpack you carry to church more important to you than the Bible you carry to church? Let me tell you something. There needs to come a time where we wake up and we get what the pastor's trying to do week in and week out and week in and week out because he's been in the mantle. He said, God, would you please help me? And when he comes out, you know what all he's trying to do? He's just trying to go, man, do you get it? Would you look at what happened here? Because there's no greater thing. Look at it, verse number 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th. Listen, young people, I totally get it that you have your own life. I totally get it that I live in church. It's what I do. It's how I live. It is the calling God has on my life. I eat it. I breathe it. I walk it. It's what I do. You say, what's your hobby? God. Listen, it's what pastors do. And I understand that it's my calling. It is my life. But in God's dear name, do you get it, what this is all about? 
And tonight, I'm just coming to you, letting you know that if we don't transfer the mantle of how big this thing is, then we won't have a church like this 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road. You may think this is on every street corner, but this isn't on every street corner. You may think that the church you attend, teenagers, exists everywhere. It doesn't exist everywhere. And if it does exist somewhere, it's because there's been a faithful pastor who has labored in the word. He has wrapped himself in the mantle. And the only thing he wants to know is do you get it? Have you felt it? Has anything happened to you when he's been preaching and getting cranked up and, and all of a sudden you felt this pressure? You, you felt it that somebody's just got to do something. If I were to tell you you're the cream of the crop, that is the truth. But for how long? How long? You're going to find out that he had his own life. But something wonderful happened on that day that the mantle hit him. I want you to notice what happened. It's right there in the text, and we'll be done here in just a moment. When he felt the mantle that was upon him, would you look at what the text says? The text says, and he left the oxen and ran after what? Elijah. Listen, when the mantle was on and Elijah was passing by and kept going, I want you to run after me and touch me on the shoulder. And he's just going on, and guess what? Did y'all see that right there? There is nothing more wonderful. Am I right? There's nothing more wonderful. Then for a young person to say, Pastor, I got it. While other young people just throw it off. What, where other young people, when, when the, the, they got their own life, they got their oxen and the pastor's doing his best he can, and he just throws it on and just casts it off. And they just throw, throw it off, throw it off. And they just cast it off and go back to their oxen. Is there anybody here tonight that you've been sitting in a preaching service in your church and God's been working on you and you knew you knew that when the mantle was falling on you, then all of a sudden he runs after Elijah. It's very interesting that when he runs after Elijah, look at the ending of the, of the text here, please. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again, for what have I to do to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew it and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and did what, please? Minister. Young people, you're third, you're third in line. You're third in line. You are, you are standing in line and your pastor and the deacon, you're third in line. If the enemy gets past your pastor... If the enemy gets past the deacons, if the enemy now comes to your shore, do you feel this responsibility to get the gospel to the world? Do you feel it? Do you sense the urgency to step up and do something? You say, but I'm young. It doesn't matter your age. It matters the job at hand. You can be a factor in your church. Nobody should have to pull you to sing and nobody should have to pull you to go soul winning and nobody should have to pull you to dress right and act right. It ought to be something that when the preacher gets up and he's preaching about the need for separation, the need for sanctification, that the mantle falls on you and you say, Pastor, I get it. Pastor, I see it. And I am willing to leave my life I have now and live a life of sanctification. That's what this is about. It's about, I'm going to leave the sanctification, but I got something bigger than that. Are you ready? He said, can I go home and tell my mom and my dad? Do you know your parents 
are paving the way for your future based on what you're telling them. Well, I want to be a doctor. They're going to pay for your medical school. Well, I want to be a lawyer. They're going to pay for your education. Well, I want to be a mechanic. They'll pay for it. But when's the last time you ever went home and told mom and dad, mom and dad, I was in a service and mom and dad, I was in a youth conference and mom and dad, I was listening to a preacher preach and mom and dad, I was listening to a pastor preach, mom and dad, I was listening to my Sunday school teacher teach and mom and dad. God did something on the inside. I don't know what God has for you, but I know this. Whatever God has for you, all of a sudden, you know what we do with our lives? We make church revolve around our lives. But when you feel this, you know what happens? God is here and life revolves around God. Teenager, do you realize how important you are to church? Have you ever been sitting in a service? The sermon's not difficult right now. But our churches need to continue for generations to come. It is just yesterday I arrived in Longview, Texas as an eighth grader. It was just yesterday I graduated from high school. It is just yesterday that I enrolled in college. It is just yesterday that I got married. It was just yesterday I came on staff for the first day. It is just yesterday... And I'm telling you that if, 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 if life keeps up, there needs to be a second and third generation back here that's ready to step up and they're ready to take the mantle and they're ready to get up and start leading. Don't wait till you're an age. Don't wait till you're at a stage. Do it now. Do it now. Kill the yoke. Kill the oxen. Bury it. Burn it. Broil it. Then go back and tell your parents, I need to let you know what God has done in my life. Years ago, a young man that God spoke to his heart and the mantle fell and he, he felt, he just felt the Holy Spirit doing something in here. And he started getting into the book. His dad always wanted him to be a doctor. His name was Robert. His dad always wanted to be a doctor. And his dad and I were talking one day, and up to that point, is that my son's going to be a doctor. We're going to get him in the best medical school. He wanted to be a geriatric doctor, working with old people. Amen. And then one day, Robert came back from camp, came back from a service, and told his dad, said, Dad, God did something in my life. And then Robert started living with that mantle. He started reading more Bible. He started getting involved in church. He started singing in groups. He started coming down to the church house. He started talking to people, passing out tracts everywhere the family would go. He would pass out tracts. Why? Because he felt it. The Spirit of God did something in him. And his dad and I were talking his first day of his senior year. And I said, Dad... How's, the, how's it going finding Robert a medical school to get into? And he said, oh, after living with that kid for the past six, eight months, the worst thing he could ever do is go to medical school because he's so about God. Wouldn't surprise me if he ends up being a preacher, which he did. I'm not saying you have to be a preacher and that's the end of the mantle. I'll tell you what the end of the mantle is. The end of the mantle is pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. And a church can only have one pastor. But it needs a whole lot of leaders. And do you know who needs to lead? Teenagers. Listen, teenagers, your life right now is at its least complicated state. Did you hear that? Your life right now is at its least complicated state. You have no bills. Oh, that's not true. I got a cell phone bill. I got to pay $30 a month to my mom and dad for. You have no bills. 
I promise you 90% of what you own, your mom and dad paid for and bought. You had, right now, least complicated state. And there is going to hit you with children and jobs and you're going to have to put hours in. And you're going to think to yourself, I wish I had more time to do. You have time to do now. And if you don't want to regret your absenteeism as a teenager, you're going to think about it down the road. And your body is not going to be what it needs to be. If you want sweet memories and you want to know you gave it everything you had, then when God speaks to your heart and God drops that mantle on you, then you say, I am going to dedicate my life to the Lord Jesus Christ because there is coming a day. Right now, he's not asking you to be first in line. Good night, that thing keeps falling off. He's not asking you to be first in line. The mantle didn't fall, so Elisha at that moment in 1 Kings 19 could be first in line. Elisha was just back here. Go to 2 Kings chapter 1. But there is coming a day. 2 Kings chapter 2, I'm sorry. 2 Kings chapter 2. Look at it. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. We need the same commitment to the church that Christ has to us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He wasn't first in line, but by the time we get to 2 Kings, guess what Elijah does do? Elijah. <laughs> Last night, got done preaching and uh, I couldn't find the door. How, how many, I don't know if you were, were you peeking? Man, I got done preaching and I'm like, okay, it's time. I'm just going to slip out the back and, 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 and I'm like, I, I, I know that door's here somewhere because <laughs> I walked out at Monday night and I'm like, where's that door? And finally I found the door and there's two ladies, three ladies standing behind that door and it's like, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Y'all, go ahead, Cortez. Finish the sermon. Hey, I would no more expect him to finish that sermon. But I've been watching you, Cortez. How many would agree? How many that know Cortez would agree with what I'm saying? Been watching it, hadn't you? And do you know what's been happening? He doesn't need to be first in line because there's others of us who it's our time. We'll fight the Ahabs. We'll fight the Jezebels. We'll take on the 450 prophets of Baal. All you have to do is go with us. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, I want to end with this. Go with us to three places. And then you're ready to lead. You know where the three places are? Bethel, Jericho, Jordan. But you won't go with us to those three places if you don't Feel, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something wonderful happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Since I met the blessed Savior. Let me tell you, you don't have to lead right now, but would you let God touch you? 
And then you're third in line. There's people here that if the enemy gets past, they'll slay him. But look, there are three places and I'm done. The first place was this, it's Bethel. Look at chapter 2, verse 3. You know what Bethel is? The place where God speaks. If you hang out long enough and you just dedicate your life, kill the oxen. Can I give you the best piece of advice you can do when you're 13 and 14? Stop talking about what you're going to do when you're 21. Stop mapping your life. Some of you need to kill the catalogs, kill the applications. You're only 14. And let God touch you. Let God put the mantle on you. Well, I've got my life mapped out. I'm going to graduate when I'm 14, and then I'm going to get my associates when I'm 15, and I'll get my bachelor's when I'm 16, and I'll get my master's when I'm 17. I'll get my doctorate by the time I'm 18, and then corporations are going to hire me. Newsflash, they're not going to hire you. And what you're doing is you're sitting in church and you're discounting everything that's being said because you're going to be a runway model, or you're going to be an, you're discounting everything that's being said. And you're just not letting God touch you. Bethel, you hang out with that mantle long enough and you, tear, you go with the preacher when he goes every service. You go with him when he preaches every time he gets up. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to go to Bethel and you are going to hear the voice of God. The second place is this. Look at verse number four. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee for the Lord has sent me to where? Jericho. Do you know that if you'll stick close to the preacher that's preaching that word every Sunday and stop planning your life at this age and just come in and say, I got my 12 yoke of oxen, I got everything how I think it needs to be. And let God put the mantle on you then what you're going to find out is, is that when God puts the mantle on you, you'll stay in tow with whatever the pastor is trying to say. And you'll hear God speak, Bethel. Then you'll go to Jericho. What was Jericho? Jericho was the place of victory. It doesn't take just one sermon to bring down the walls in your life. How many times they go around that wall? And they went around that wall. And they went around that wall. And they went around that wall. Do you know what your pastor wants to do? He just wants to see you win victories. How long have you been coming to church? Well, since September. Since September. Man, what a voice. Since September. You, you could have been the black knight, amen? And Because uh, I promise you could grow a better beard than he'll ever think he can grow. And uh, hey, Seth, just kidding. And, and watch this. Do, do, you, do you know... Jericho, they just marched around those walls. You know all Pastor Myers wants to do with the E in his last name? Every Sunday, he just wants to take you around the walls. And Cortez, by this time next year, guess what's going to happen? You'll be closer to taking over. Here's why. Because you're going to go to Bethel with him. And you're going to go to Jericho with him. Are you getting tired? Because I am. <laughs> Do you know the worst thing you can ever say to a pastor? Is when they look at you and say, how's your relationship with your parents? How's your relationship with your parents? And I just want you to go good. Right? Right? Hey, how's your relationship with your parents? It could be better. No, no, just say good. How's your relationship with your parents? Good. Good. Like you love them? Yes, sir. Like, like you don't hate them? Like you don't have that much hate? Are you sure? Sure. Pastors are like, oh, okay. We're weird. Now say you hate them. You ready? How's your relationship with your parents? I hate them. <laughs> you hate them? <laughs> like, like a deep hate. Deep hate. Like, like I hate, 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 hate. Come on, let's win that victory. <laughs> and guess what? We're at our finest when you got problems. Because that's what we do. That's how we roll. That's what we love. 
I want to tell you why. Because we know there's coming a time we won't be here. And Elijah and Elisha, but it all started with them knowing there's something should be different about me. And Elisha was third in line, but by the time you get to 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah goes to heaven. The third place he took him, it's, it's right there in the text. And verse number 6 is where? Jordan. What is Jordan? Jordan is the permanent Christian life. It's when you finally cross over to where you don't want anything to do with that world. But it all starts where? You know where it all starts? It all starts that day that the pastor's preaching and all he wants to do is for you to feel it. And once you feel it, then you'll burn all your oxen and you'll burn all your dreams and you'll just simply say, God, whatever you want. Whatever you want. And then you stick close to those spiritual leaders and stick close to moms and dads who love God. And I'll tell you what will happen. They'll take you to Bethel. You'll hear God's voice. And then they'll take you to Jericho and you'll win victories. And then they'll take you to Jordan. And if you would, are you there? Look at verse 7. These Bible college students, they love to smart off. And the 50 sons, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood over and view afar off. And the two stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together. Watch this. And smote the waters. And they were what, please? Divided. Divided. You're going to find out that Elisha did double the miracles that Elijah did. Holy Spirit told me I just need to be done. But it all starts. I, I believe this. I, I believe that, that our churches are in good hands. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I believe God's raising up another generation. Amen. That if something happened to where we didn't show up one day, that I believe there's some 40 and 30 year olds that could step in and get it done and do a great job. But you're next in line. And young people, it's youth conferences like this that we have to have people that are forged in his image that now's when you step up and now's when you hang out around God and now's when you win the victories and now is when you hear the voice of God and now is when you decide to cross over because it won't, if the Lord tarries is coming in 10 years, how old are you going to be? In 20 years, how old are you going to be? How old? 37. 30, Brother Hicks, how old were you when you started preaching? How old? And in 20 years, you're going to be how old? 37? You. You'll be the church leaders. But I know it's scary right now, isn't it? But if you can't even read your Bible, what hope does the church have 20 years from right now? Is it okay if I pick on you? If you can't even get your sanctification and you're not, you don't, God doesn't mean much to you, what's going to happen 20 years to the church? Don't knock him because I'm going to look at you, brother. <laughs> hey, we were all hoping that would have landed on a haircut because we were wanting you to lose your hair. <laughs> I understand you can't be first in line because you would be like court as you go. You probably have a lot to say. God's probably done a lot in your heart. I agree. You would agree with that? I do. Are you ready to get up? It's coming, though, isn't it? I'm not holy enough. <laughs> your voice is deep enough. <laughs> Please listen to the preachers in your life. But more than that, would you let God do something? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, can I ask you? Thank you, Pastor.
Can I ask you a question? Has God touched you in any way this week? We're going to bring it down to this. If you could honestly say, God has thrown the mantle on me. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know this. Right now, I'm going to burn the oxen. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to let my mom and dad know what's going on, and then I'm going to hang around God because I want to see what God's going to do in my life. Young people in the balcony and on the lower floor, let's make one final commitment and let's come to the altar and say, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take next year to remake commitments. I'm, I'm going to stare up. I'm going to step up. If God has done something on you, then recognize it. Embrace it and tell the Lord, Lord, I know I won't be first in line, but I promise you this. That when my time comes to be a church leader, I'm going to be one. Recognize that God wants to do something in your life. Elijah was just a man, but boy, he did God's work. If you want to encourage your pastor, you can encourage him by letting him know, Pastor, I want to let you know that I love the Lord and thank you for all your preaching. And I'm going to make God number one in my life. And I'm burning my oxen. Father, thank you for what you've done in our hearts tonight and the last few days. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with these young people. I pray, Father, now as we, we move away from here, that you would help us to take the decisions we've made and, Lord, make them a reality, to be willing to fight whatever it is we have to fight to do what you have worked in our hearts to do. Well, thank you for everything you've done, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for those messages tonight. Of course, um, I hope that you thank your leaders for bringing you and taking the time and the effort and the energy to get you here. You know it would be really nice? Be back here next year and say, you know, this last year God worked in my heart all year long. And let God do that. We're so grateful for your effort, your energy to be here. And uh, we're glad that you would allow us to be a part of your life in that effort. Brother Russ, why don't you cover? We have a couple of announcements. Well, we have pizza outside for the winning team. <laughs> Brother Mark's going to come announce it in a minute here. But right before that, Brother Mark, he's going to announce the winning team. Uh, you may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, he's going to announce the winning team, and then um, the ushers are going to give the uh, tickets to you if you're on the winning team so you can get uh, a pizza. Pacific Baptist, uh, if you are uh, from our church and you're a teenager, we want to take a group picture real fast right after like we did last year. Come tell us the winning team. And then it, your team, if you're on that team, stand so the ushers can get you those tickets. All right. Can I get a drum roll, please? The split is 3,000 points with 183,000 points in first place. We have the Royals. Good job, good job. Ushers, come on down. Please stay standing. We're going to give you your tickets. Thank you. Let's all give each other a hand. Thank you guys so much for participating. You guys did a great job. All right, if you can get that real fast. 
to that musher so they can sit down and we can get this thing going. Uh, uh, Mark, help them out. Pass those tickets out, please. All right. The winning team gets tickets. The losing team gets a fish slap on the way out. <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't want to have to deal with lawyers. All right. So they're getting tickets. Brother Benner, where are you at? Come on up here. Faith Baptist Imperial, and uh, thank, thankful for them coming. They come just about every year. He's going to lead us. Can we all stand now? Would that be fine? Let's all stand, and we'll have a closing word of prayer. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for this youth conference, dear Lord. I pray these young men, young ladies, dear Lord, will take these messages, dear Lord, and apply it to their lives, dear Lord. And I pray for safety for these churches and they go home. Just have your hands upon them, dear Lord. And have your hands upon these preachers, dear Lord, that came out here. They just keep them safe. And dear Lord, I pray that these young men and young ladies will go back to their church. For the ones that didn't come, that they'll tell them what they got from this conference. And I pray that they can go home and share it with their friends and be able to give the gospel out. And show up on Sunday, dear Lord, and go out and help. And help their youth leaders, dear Lord, to go out and get more teenagers to come to church. And I just pray you just have your hands upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Uh, Pacific Baptist, please stay for that group picture. You are dismissed. If you did not.